Let's get to some of the political response here. I have to say, Joe Biden went a lot farther than I thought he would based on his past rhetoric around unions, which has always been very careful and very, ah, I don't want to weigh in, very both sides, based on you know where the Democratic Party has been for years under Obama, under Clinton, certainly, um, where, if anything, they were siding with the boss class. Not only did he really clearly take the side of the workers here, but he also adopted some of the union's own framing and messaging around record contracts, record profits mean record contracts. Let's take a listen to a little bit of what he had to say. I respect workers' right to use their options under the collective bargaining system. And I understand the workers' frustration. Over generations, auto workers sacrificed so much to keep the industry alive and strong, especially through the economic crisis and the pandemic. Workers deserve a fair share of the benefits they help create for an enterprise. I do appreciate that the parties have been working around the clock. I, and when I first called them at the very first day of the negotiations, I said, please stay at the table as long as you can to try to we'll work this out. And the, they've been around the clock, and the companies have made some significant offers. But I believe they should go further to ensure record corporate profits mean record contracts for the UAW. Let me say that again. Record corporate profits, which they have, should be shared by record contracts for the UAW. So there you hear, like I said, the union framing. Record profits from the automakers should mean record contracts, which I think is a concept that you know everyone should sort of get behind. And I don't know why he sounds different on this one, Sagar. I think it's partly because he's a car guy. He's really obsessed mm -hmm. with the auto industry. Um, he was part, obviously, of the bailout back under the Obama administration. You know, Bin Laden's dead, GM's alive. That was his catchphrase that he came up with that they ran on in yeah. 2012. What'd you make of his comments? So I thought it was interesting. I do think it's electoral. I think it's, uh, you know, you can read a poll. 75% of the people are supporting unions, uh, all-time support for a strike. He needs to win Michigan and Wisconsin and the car mm -hmm. areas all over again. There's a, Don't forget, what killed Mitt Romney in 2012? That op-ed that he wrote, what was it, December 2009, let Detroit go oh. bankrupt. He was like, I didn't write the headline. That's uh, not what I... Okay, Listen, dude. You can say whatever you want. <laughs> but uh, people in Michigan all decided to quote that whenever they were voting for Obama, and the Obama campaign blasted it all over. Now, actually, Trump very smartly leveraged um, union support against Hillary and in Ohio as well, to mm. both to win Michigan in 2016 and then also to win um, Ohio and increasingly going there. Oh, what is the... I forget the county... Exactly, like the heavy union density county in Ohio, which had a former GM plant. Mm -hmm. um, and they actually voted even more for Trump in 2020. But the point that he's always done is he's tried to like leverage the idea of like outsourcing, fighting against that, going against the trade deals. Whereas Hillary was very much like, she didn't know where the hell she stood on these issues. So I thought it was smart of him to do that, you know, at the, at the, at the gasp of trying to get to the industrial Midwest on his side. Because remember, you know, he didn't win Wisconsin or Michigan by all that many votes. A yeah. lot of people actually forget Get that even though he did win you know they don't look at that what the margins are in some of these states all trump has to do is win three of the biden states and he wins the election in 2020 yeah and in these yeah. states you know it's just having lived in ohio it's not just the people who work directly in the industry i mean first of all you have a lot of suppliers and a lot of the surrounding economy that is really devoted to the industry but it also is just part of the ethos and the pride of those states so when you make a really clear statement like Biden actually did there, again, surprisingly, of being on the side of the workers over the bosses. Yeah, that is that is going to land. Um, Trump, on the other hand, got asked what I thought was actually the best question that Kristen Welker asked her during um, her Meet the Press interview with him, which became very controversial, which mm -hmm. we could talk about another time. But um, she asked him very directly, which side are you on? Whose side are you on? And instead of giving anything approaching a direct answer, he goes on this meandering thing about EVs and uh, it's the union's fault that Biden got elected, et cetera, et cetera. Let's listen to how he approached this issue. My question for you, Mr. President, whose side are you on in this? Uh, I'm on the side of uh, making our country great. Uh, the auto workers uh, are not going to have any jobs when you come right down to it, because if you take a look at what they're doing with electric cars, Electric cars are going to be made in China. The auto workers are not going to have any... I'll tell you what. The auto workers are being sold down the river by their leadership, and their leadership should endorse Trump. The reason is, you got to have choice. Like in school, I want school choice. I also want choice for cars. If somebody wants gasoline, if somebody wants all electric, they can do whatever they want. But they're destroying 
the consumer, and they're destroying the auto workers. The auto workers will not have any jobs, Kristen, because the, all of these cars are going to be made in China. The electric cars automatically are going to be made in China. In response to the question, whose side are you on? He just doesn't answer, really. And, you know, there's a few things here. We went over some of his comments on this before. Number one, he either doesn't know or has just decided to ignore the fact that the guy who, who's in charge of the UAW now, Sean Fain, he's only been there five months. Right. He has nothing to do with and previous union leadership. And actually ran the previous He ran against the previous, about. exactly. Mm -hmm. And so members just elected him because he closely represents their interests and because it very much appears like they support this militant direction that they are taking. That's number one. On the EV part, he loves to say that there's a mandate for EVs. Not true. I would be all for it if Republicans were actually in favor of, hey, we're going to move to, you know, we're going to make sure that we support the EV industry and that it's got to be union jobs and it's got to be good wages. That's not what they're about. They just don't want to see EVs at all, which means you're going to completely see that entire industry to China. That's so, what they really want. I, this is where I disagree a bit because the Biden EPA, I did a monologue on this before, so I wanted to have all the details. They have the rule that they want to say that two thirds of new cars and a quarter of new heavy trucks sold in the US by 2032 are all electric. So it's not a mandate, but they're going to effectively do it through the EPA. Now, that rule has not passed. Let's be clear. It was proposed for uh, public comment, but it's very likely so to they have law under the Biden administration. So they have a proposed theoretical no, no, no. rule by 2032. It's not that. Administrative law, the way that it works is that whenever you're about to change change what administrative guidelines are. You have to publish public notice in the same way for like an X amount of period before it can go into an effect. So by all accounts, this is very likely to be the actual law, at least the EPA administrative rule that gets put into place, almost certainly by the end of 2024. So then the question is, can we actually go to two thirds of new cars and a quarter of new heavy trucks sold in the US by 2032, all electric? Not a chance in hell. I also support the ability to be able to drive gas powered vehicles if they so want. I do think electric vehicles are uh, very important for our future. I also agree um, with the critique that they make about China. Now that said, they didn't do a lot of this stuff while they were in office and that's actually where I get upset because my response would be like, I agree that it is a strategic national imperative that battery technology, which is not just useful for electric vehicles, but battery research, which is great for universities and all that is heavily rolled up in China and they have all of the support. So let's do what we did with the chip sack and let's build it here. Right. That's what I would say. Right. So I, I, Which is some of what is in the Inflation Reduction Act. Some, but not even close to enough. I mean, but, once again, the IRA is going to, we will maybe, what are we at, 10% of new cars, electric, maybe 5% or whatever that's bought on the lot. If we're lucky, we'll get to 25, 25% in two years. The other problem is, and this is the big three problem, and actually this has nothing to do with the unions. They don't make good cars at all. Like the uh, GM, what was it, the GM Bolt has already been, dis, uh, it's already been discontinued. The only G, big three EV that's worth buying at all is the Ford Mustang uh, Mach. I was going to say, like, I disagree with that. Uh, I love my mom. No, but I'm saying that is the only one. You know, what are you going to drive? The Cadillac Lyric? The thing that looks like a shit box. I'm like, let's be honest. Oh, I actually um, like the way it looks. Uh, but, uh, okay, but the performance max, all that stuff, it's not going to work, in my opinion. But, Sagar, yeah. let's be real about what are they proposing. They're not proposing to do anything about I, these I issues. don't disagree. I'm just they saying just the critique wanna, is correct. They just want to shit on yeah. EVs. Yeah. That's it. It's not like I have a better plan that's going to make sure that these jobs are here in America and make sure that it's union jobs. And by the way, not to get into the weeds here, but in the Inflation Reduction Act, originally the White House wanted a rule in there that would require these to be union jobs, which would be really important. And which is exactly why the fact that didn't make it in is why Sean Fain and the UAW are not endorsing Joe Biden yet, which is another thing that Trump seems to like mislead on on all of this. You're, you're and it was basically Joe Manchin. And none of the Republicans supported any of this, by the way. So the choice is either you can go. Do I think that the Biden administration has done enough? No, I don't. Obviously, I've been critical of them on a number of times on this front. It should have been a requirement that is union jobs. They should do more to make sure this industry is here in America, like you said, like with the CHIPS Act. But the Republicans and Trump specifically and J.D. Vance, who put out very similar things on Twitter, they don't want to do anything. They just want to say, here, China, go ahead, have the industry. We're just going to try to hold on to just the, um, you know, the traditional gas powered part of the market for as long as we can. When whether you have a guidance from the government in place or not, the automakers of their own volition were moving in this direction because they can see the writing on the wall that this is one of the key industries of the future. So are we going to compete in this industry or are we not? And that's kind of the choice here. And Again, to go back to the, you know, the core of this, he gets asked, whose side are you on? And Donald Trump, supposed to Mr. Working Class, whatever, he can't say. 
He cannot say. None of them has been able to say. There was, I think, one Republican who represents some moderate, you know, D Joe Biden district in New York who was able to say something somewhat pro-worker. But all of these other supposedly pro-worker senators and congressmen uh, on the Republican side, they've all tacitly backed the bosses in this. They cannot say that we think the workers should get a better Well, building. I would disagree that J.D. doesn't support building anything new because, I, I look, I haven't talked to him about it. I don't know. Full disclosure, I've known the guy for a long time. Uh, but the point is, is that I would say, if, if he's, look, we say he supports more worker fun, or more uh, worker pay, but Trump can't even bring himself to say that. So I would just put it that way. I agree. Look, I think most of this is weaponized. Uh, it's weaponized uh, cynicism in order to undermine it on behalf of the oil industry. That's the vast majority. Mm -hmm of the Republican Party, um, and specifically gas-powered vehicles. At a structural level, I really just don't know what to do because here's the truth. Tesla is beating every single one of these people and eating their lunch. They're dropping prices while they're able to fight. And even, the, like I said, the vast majority of the EV vehicles or prop proposals that have come out since, you know, the only one, as I said, the Mustang, I mean, that's a luxury vehicle, unfortunately. In order to try and make it accessible, the Asian countries and Tesla are the only ones even able to compete. You've got the Hyundai, what is it, Ionic 5, I think, the Kia, uh, the Kia actually is quite affordable. It actually looks like a, a good ride. But my point is, is that the people who are playing in that space are not big three makers. So there's a structural level where I think it's interesting and important, but I don't disagree. I don't think the Trump administration would do anything um, necessarily on this. And I also don't have any confidence the vast majority of Republicans would back an industrial policy to bring battery technology here to the United States. I think it's- They've never imperative. proposed anything. The other you thing- know, if is, they support it, they should propose something. The important thing to understand too is that even if we don't go electric, the rest of the world will. I was in India. It was really troubling. I was seeing some Chinese like BYD vehicles um, that were on the road. India is actually going uh, very heavily into electric vehicles as well. I saw it in multiple um, that were there. So we want to maintain like our ability to also export some of the future technology to the world the way that China um, is and wants to do. That's not, it's not just about domestic policy. It's also about one of the things with oil is we have a ton of it. We actually are, net, I think we're a net oil exporter in some cases, which I think is stupid for a uh, whole other reasons, but it gives us strategic independence and a big economic function. Unfortunately, none of this is happening in, po in public policy. So you're not wrong. Well, I don't disagree with you. Some of it is yeah. happening in public well, policy. I mean, in the Inflation Reduction Act, you have not only incentives, you you have some attempts at real industrial policy so that we are part of that future and we don't just cede the whole thing to China. We are way behind in terms of moving in that direction. And you also have some efforts at consumer incentives to try to make these vehicles more affordable. Mm -hmm. well, that's mostly a Tesla, uh, mostly Tesla's been using, I believe, because it's a tiered system where the union, I think it's 7,500 off for a union-made vehicle and then 5,000 off for a non-union-made vehicle. Uh, but my point is the tax the tax credit system is not it has not been the impetus that was wanted in the consumer market mm. for well, Tesla, at least at least less. Tesla could always yeah. unionize. And huh? I mean that's the other thing is, you know, this fight for the auto workers is so much bigger than just their wages because you can see already with what happened with UPS and the Teamsters. The number of Americans who um, understand that being part of a union is going to secure you a better deal has skyrocketed. Mm -hmm. The amount of interest and in organizing um, has skyrocketed. The amount of work actions skyrocketed. And you also have somewhat of a more favorable landscape for union organizing right now with this National Labor Relations Board. So it makes it easier for, you know, if you're, for example, if you are working at FedEx and you see what the UPS drivers are getting, I mean, this is a problem for FedEx. They're going to have Huge to up problem. their wages in order to compete. And it's the same thing with Tesla. I mean, mm -hmm. they're going to have to, their workers are looking at the deal that these auto workers secure and they're way further down the totem pole in terms of what they're earning. I mean, that's going to impact that whole industry, whether or not they're unionized. So that's why these fights matter, not just for the workers that are directly impacted. I agree with you completely. Hey guys, if you like that video, go to breakingpoints.com, become a premium subscriber and help us build the best independent media organization on the planet. That's right, we're subscriber funded, we're building something new, we wanna replace these failing mainstream media organizations. So again, to subscribe, it's breakingpoints.com.